Hello, welcome to the Stay Internet Safe workshop. This workshop aims to make your online life a little bit secure. In the digital world, where we are constantly on the internet, there is a need to understand the fun as well as the insecure sides of it. In this session, we will cover how to manage different settings and be secure on your phones when dealing with apps. We will go over some common hacking practices that malicious hackers use, like spam email, website spoofing, etc. We will discuss differences between security and privacy and why they are important. We hope at the end of this session, you will learn about how to stay safe against various forms of attacks and apply simple techniques to protect yourself on the internet. Before we get started, let me introduce you to your instructors. Arushi, Twesha and I, Apoorva, will take you through this workshop today. We are all software engineers at NetApp and are passionate about technology. While we love tech, we also like to keep, our, keep ourselves aware of various security best practices. We may not be security engineers or experts, but we have taken classes about security and continue to be safe and promote internet safety in our work and day-to-day -day lives. So let's begin. In this section, we will talk about how to be secure on your phone while you use different apps on it. What private data about you the apps may have and how can you protect them? I'm sure most of you recognize all of these apps. You may have some or all of them on your phone. Think about which of them you use on a day-to-day -day basis and if you can identify all of them. Now let's get into some application basics. We will talk about how these apps make money and what features on your phone can these apps have access to and how you can manage those settings. Let's go to the first one. Do you pay for any of these apps? No, all of them are free to download. You can download them from um, your App Store or your Play Store. So if you don't have to pay for them, how are these apps making money? How are they a billion dollar company? Let's find out. They are making money by showing you ads. If you have seen Instagram or any social media, every fourth or fifth post is a sponsored advertisement. These ads are very relevant to you based on your activity online. If you happen to click on these sponsored posts, the apps make money. If you happen to buy the product by clicking on an ad, the apps make even more money. Let's see a few examples. This is a screenshot of my Insta feed. The ads I see here would be very different than the ads you see on your feed. Why? Based on my activity on the internet, where I typically am browsing for makeup products, the apps know that placing a Sephora ad on my feed will make the most sense as I would be very likely to click on it compared to someone who has never looked for makeup products online. Same thing with the standing desk ad. I've been looking for one in the recent past and it shows up on my feed. You will see the exact same thing happen on Facebook too. I have recently searched for and visited Crate and Barrel store. The likelihood of me clicking on this ad is much higher than someone who hasn't. So I see these ads more frequently. One thing to note also is that the apps try to make these ads more and more seamless within your feed. So it looks very similar to what a post from a friend would look like. But this is an ad and it makes it harder for you and me to avoid looking at it. So 
What can you do? Unfortunately, ads are how these companies make money. So you cannot avoid it. However, you can manage your preferences to see less relevant ads. Here's how you would do it on Android. So you would go into your settings and then look for Add Preferences. So once you go in there, you will see a variety of options to keep on or hide some of the ads that you'd see on a daily basis. So you can go in and change all of that. You can go into Add Settings to find out if Facebook use, you would use your internet activity on any other apps to use and use that to sell you ads or, or make you look at ads. So you want to go into all of these options and make sure you have clicked not allowed. So notice how all of these settings are buried and it's hard to find. It's done on purpose because the more options, if they're easily available for you to manage, the apps will not make as much money. So let's go back. So the homework for you uh, for this part of the session is to learn how to manage ad settings on other apps that you use. Try to do it on TikTok. Try to do it on Instagram. Find out what you can, what options that they have available for you to toggle. Let's move on to what information these, have, these apps have on you. It may be your location, your email, password, contacts on your phone, your photos, and or your credit card information if you've made any purchases on these apps. How do you stay informed? What should you do before downloading an app? Let's look at some of the app permissions and some of the information that you need to have on hand. So what should you do and what should you check before downloading an app? Make sure the app is legit. So how you would do that is just by quickly Google searching the app, understand if the app has any data breaches or security vulnerabilities. For example, TikTok is a huge offender of this. Try and search for TikTok security issues and you would see a lot of information on what are the ongoing issues and security issues with TikTok. Learn to read user reviews on an app store. This goes without saying that you should not be downloading any app which is not from the app store or play store, which is a trusted um, store for uh, downloading applications. Read user reviews and find out if users have found any issues um, while using the app. Understand what permissions the app needs on your phone. Does it need to access your photos, for example? If it does, understand why it needs it. This information is available on the App Store under details of any app. So be sure to check it out before you download. Now let's say you've already downloaded an app. How could you deny apps access to specific features on your phone? Let's find out. You would go onto your settings and this is an Android phone and within settings, you would go into apps and notifications and under there, you would find app permissions. That's the fourth one on the list. Once you find it, you click on it and you'll find all the different features on your phone that apps have access to. For example, now let's go into location. You would see that the list on the top all of these apps have access to my location all the time. And when you scroll down, these apps will have location access only when in use. So I go into a pizza app that I had downloaded a while ago, but I wasn't sure what permissions it needed. And I don't think it needs my location anytime. So I will go and hit deny 
on that on that application. So you would want to do this on all the existing apps that you have. Just look at the applications that you have on your phone and then try to understand what features it needs and if it needs needs all of them. So the homework for you after this session is learn how to do it um, and deny apps access on iOS. Hope this section was useful to you and hopefully you will stay safe while downloading and using applications on your phone. Now let's look into what hackers are looking for and why are they looking for these things. They basically start with trying to obtain your personal information, such as your name, address, phone number, and birth date. All of these might be available on your social media and accessible to anyone who follows you, or if you have a public account, then to the whole internet. Why are they looking to get this information on you? Let's Try to think about what you would have to do if you have to pretend to be me to fool my parents. Well, you'd need to learn to walk, talk, and look like me. Of course, you need my awesome sense of humor and wittiness, but all of this will take some effort. But if you wanted to convince an account, then it won't be that difficult. All you need is my username and password to pretend that you are me. And this is called a simple identity theft. To do this, you need the information on the screen. Think about all the times you gave out this information on membership forms or surveys. Next time somebody asks you these information, make sure you verify who they are and why they need this information. Let's look into some techniques that the hacker used to steal your personal information. They usually send out emails like this one, requesting for an account and password information. Something happened something went wrong and they need your password and your account information to make it right. You're scared and you reply with the requested account and password because you don't want anything bad to happen. So you follow the request. What could go wrong here? Did you check who is sending you this email? Did you check if the reason they are giving is valid or not? And most importantly, what is the correct, correct response in this case? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. And I'll take you to an example. So I received this email that says urgent account will be closed and I'm scared. It says, please update the password of your account or it will be closed. And it is from the security team. They have even given me a link to go and do that update. What would happen if I follow through Click on the link, give my account details. Let's check out. You are hacked. So first I should always check who this email came from. 
Who was the sender? The next thing to check is the link itself. So you can copy the address, open a new tab, and paste the address in it. And as you can see, it's a website I don't know. So I should not click on it and give my information to the hackers. Hackers usually give false statements in the email, hoping they will upset you or excite you, like in this example, where you receive an email offering you a free e-gift card if you fill up a survey. Can you guess what questions will they ask you in the survey? You're right. They're going to ask you simple questions like your name, address, date of birth, and maybe your driver license number or your SSN. Should you fill up the survey and give your information to the hacker? No. Then what is the correct response here? The correct response is to never respond to such emails. So I have a chance to win a $100 gift card. It reads, this is an amazing opportunity to win a $100 gift card. Just fill out the simple survey form. Hurry, offer is for a limited time only. I follow through, I click on the email, click on the link given in the email. Takes me to a survey. And it's asking for my name and my email address. What will the hacker use this information for? They'll use this information to send me more emails, but they'll make it more personalized because now they know my name. So you should always check the sender, copy the link address in the new tab, and again, check where the link is taking you. Is it a valid website? Or they're just out there trying to get your personal information? One more way they can get your information is they can send out malware that will do that job for you. So you receive an email with an attachment and you're trying to find out what that attachment has, so you click on it. And without you knowing it, it downloads a malware. A malware is just a software that the hacker wrote to take that information from your laptop. Think about how much information do you store, your personal information you store on your laptop. A hacker does not need your permission to steal all that information once they get the malware on your system. So what should be the correct response here? The correct response would be to not click on these emails, to not click on this attachment. You should ignore emails com coming from people you don't know. Now let's look into an example 
to see how hackers do it. And again, we will check for who this email is coming from. And also the attachment before we download it. So I received this email that says, important fund transfer done. And it says that the receipt is attached, but I didn't do any fund transfer. So I should be aware of clicking on this website or this attachment. The things to check here are again, it, it's a good thing that I can see the attachment without clicking on it. But that would not be the case if the attachment is a PDF or a zip file. Again, you can see that these emails are really personalized. They really ad address you by name. And this is what the attachment contains. If it was a zip file and I wanted to see my receipt, I would have downloaded it, unpacked it to check. Let's look into more about how we can stay safe. What are some preventive measures And then we'll follow up by talking more about multi-factor authentication and backup. The last few examples we went through, we should always be aware of what personal information we are providing and why is it needed, why the other person is asking for it. And never give out your driver's license number or your social security or your passport number. Never give out your parents credit card number on the phone or in an email. You should only respond to people or organizations you know and trust. Ignore the emails from people you don't know. Now let's look into more in, into multi-factor authentication. So let's suppose you accidentally filled out one of those forms or, or clicked on those links and now the hacker has your username and password. And sometimes people use the same password and maybe the username for multiple websites. So that makes you very vulnerable. In that case, you can use multi-factor authentication to protect you. What multi-factor authentication do is, it asks you for your password, and then it also sends you a pin via email, text, or call. And until you have that pin, you won't be allowed to access the account. So, in the scenario where your password gets stolen, it protects you. Similarly with the biometrics, where you can use your fingerprint to open account. 
So I'm trying to set multi-factor authentication for my Gmail account. And if you have a different account, you can just Google for that. Just Google set multi-factor authentication and it'll give you steps on how to do it. So the Google website says why you need it. Because you're using the same password on more than one site, you're downloading software from the internet, you're clicking links in email messages. All of those things that we did. And it keeps you safe even if they have your password. So if they have your password, they could lock you out. They could change the password and then you won't be able to log back in. So let's set it up. Add an extra layer of security. And it won't let the hackers get into your account. So it asked me to give my password to log in. And then it is checking other devices that I'm logged in with. So I'm logged in on my phone and I have one plus six, I can see that. You should be able to see your phone. If you're not able to, then they have these links to follow. If you need help, don't see your device. If you click on that, you'll be able to get some help if you can't see your device. So why are they asking me for my device information? Because they're going to send me a link. So they send me a prompt and they're asking me to say yes if I'm using that. In case you don't have a phone, you can use this backup numbers instead. You can copy them and use them instead of a pen. So Google just sent me a pen on my phone because I selected receive it via text. And here it is. and have turned on the two-step verification. You can use this backup codes or authentication app or security keys. These are options that work if you're offline or if you're traveling and you don't have network. Or you simply don't own a phone. Then you can use these options too. And then here you can come and revoke all. In this case, if you don't remember all the different systems you're logged on. Another interesting thing that I want to go to is that Gmail has this password manager. We can use password managers to remember our password. And this also gives us a nice feature of checking how strong our passwords are. So it says, my passwords are unique. That's a good thing, but two accounts have a weak password. So I should update them. Also, it has a location sharing option, which you can turn off and also select 
what personal information is available. The next thing is I want to talk about is backup. So you accidentally clicked on the attachment and now there is a malware on your system and it has corrupted all your files. That means you cannot open your files. And the hacker is asking you for credit card information in order to get your files access back. In that case, you can prepare by having a backup. So you can simply copy your important files into a hard disk or on the cloud. So if you already have a backup in the scenario where the hacker takes over your system or even if physically steals your laptop, you would have access to all your files. For this, I would again use my Gmail account and would walk you through steps on how to set it up. So on your account, you'll see this drive option. And as you can see, I've uploaded some things for the conference already on the drive. There's an upload option on the left. You can select upload files then select the file you want to upload. And on the right, you'll see that it's uploading it. It's simple, easy, and safe. Now let's say I also want to share this with my friends. so that they can download. So it also has an option to download. To share it, I need the address of my friends. And that's it, you're good to go. Your friends will receive an email with the link to access this file. Google has some other options like photos, where you can upload your favorite photos, or slides, so you can just make your slides on this platform. The next couple of sections will focus on privacy, security, and the different career paths that you can take. First and foremost, we will discuss the difference between privacy and security. These two terms are often used interchangeably, but actually mean very different things. Let's talk about privacy. Privacy is defined as having the ability to protect sensitive information about personally identifiable information. It refers to the rights of individuals, such as ourselves, and our right to essentially be left alone. However, in today's data-centric world, there's many other questions to ask when discussing privacy. For example, from a personal perspective, consider what data is being collected? What are the uses of this data? And who is this data being shared with? These are also questions companies must ask when building products. For example, as Apurva talked about earlier, Facebook collects information about us that allows companies to target ads towards us. This is why it's really important for us to think about what data we are sharing with the world. There are a few privacy laws out there that companies must follow. Two of these are the General Data Protection Regulation, known as GDPR, and Children's Online Privacy Protection Rule, known as COPPA. First, we'll talk about GDPR. This is a regulation that requires businesses to protect data and privacy of European Union citizens for transactions that occur within European Union member states, even if your app or website is based in the US. If companies don't comply, they could end up paying large fees and even face legal action. This gives users control over their personal data because companies must get consent from the subjects prior to obtaining 
any information such as first and last names, email addresses, location, browser history, among others. COPPA is another one of these. It's one that we NetApp as a company had to follow in order to bring this event to you all. COPPA spells out what organizations creating websites and online service must do to protect the online privacy and safety of children under the age of 13. For example, companies may need to get parental consent before letting a child sign up for a service. These are just two examples of privacy laws that organizations must follow. There's a lot out there and as a technology progresses and the need for data grows, there might be more that come up. To stay on top of these, you can read tech blogs such as TechCrunch for discussion on such topics. Next up is security. Institutions like banks and hospitals collect very sensitive information about us. So it's crucial that personally identifiable information such as electronic medical records and banking information don't end up in the hands of bad actors. Organizations need to protect the data collected from unauthorized access or corruption. So security is what you do with the data that you've gathered from the users. For example, considering things like where to store the data, whether or not to encrypt it, and who gets access to this data. This doesn't necessarily only, only relate to data collected from external sources, but internal information as well. For example, companies don't want confidential information out there available to the world. The internal data needs to be kept secure as well, and companies have to consider this. I'm sure you've all heard about companies getting hacked and customer sensitive data getting leaked. So let's talk about a few of these in recent times. Target is a big one, and I'm sure a lot of you shop at Target. In 2013, Target suffered a data breach that impacted millions of customers across the United States. The attack began with a malware-laced email phishing attack that was sent to employees at a third-party company that did business with Target. This enabled the hackers to steal network credentials. Soon after this, the thieves started stealing card data from thousands of Target cash registers. And Target ended up having to pay $18.5 million. Another company you may be familiar with is Twitter. In 2013, 2018, it was discovered that Twitter had a bug in their software that may have caused some users' passwords to be stored in readable text in their systems. Normally, our passwords are hashed prior to being stored. And we'll talk about hashing in more detail later. Luckily, Twitter was able to catch this and fix this bug before any passwords were stolen or misused. However, 330 million users still had to change their passwords. These are just two examples. Recently, companies like Facebook, Uber, Equifax have also experienced data breaches. I encourage you to look those up and read about them if you're interested. Next, we'll talk about some techniques companies implement to protect data. First up is authentication. Authentication technology verifies if a user's credentials match those stored in the company's database. Today, we use multiple ways to identify that we are who we say we are. For example, you may have to enter a password and then get a code delivered to your email or your phone that you then have to enter in to get into your website or an app. This is known as multi-factor authentication and many companies make use of this. Another is encryption. Data encryption software enhances data security by using an algorithm called a cipher and an encryption key to turn normal text into encrypted ciphertext. To someone who is unauthorized to see this data, the ciphertext will be completely unreadable. However, an authorized user can decrypt the data with a key and read the information. Encryption protects data at rest, which is data that is stored, and data in transit, which is data exchanged between mobile devices or cloud, such as texting and email. Another technique I mentioned earlier is hashing. We all have usernames and passwords that we enter when logging into a website or an application. Companies don't actually store the plain text passwords that we create, or they shouldn't. Instead, they use an algorithm to hash the passwords and then they store the hash. 
These are only a few of many different, different approaches that companies take to protect our data. Many will actually implement multiple to protect user and employee data. Now that we've discussed privacy and security, let's talk about the different career paths in this field. As technology advances, there will be a need for people who are well versed in the area of privacy in the tech sector. sector. Companies are increasingly hire, hiring people who are specialized in this area one way or another. Privacy engineering is an emerging discipline within software, which aims to provide new tools and techniques to provide privacy. Privacy engineer, engineers ensure that considerations are actually integrated into the design of the product itself. Privacy attorneys work with the clients to respond to data breaches, defend litigation involving breaches, and even be involved in drafting policy for a company or a governmental institution. For example, GDPR and COPPA, which we talked about earlier, was the work of many people, including many attorneys. A chief privacy officer is an executive who is responsible for developing and implementing policies that protect employee and customer data from unauthorized access. CPOs must also know both the company's operations as well as privacy laws. They're in charge of communicating details of the company's privacy policy to employees and customers. The CPO is also the point person for external inquiries related to privacy. Data protection officers are new to this field. GDPR, which we talked about earlier, required some companies to create a data protection officer role. This requirement created a market for individuals with the necessary skill set and experience. In some companies, while a data protection officer may not be a role, it may be a responsibility that an employee takes on. As you may have guessed already, computer science, law school, cybersecurity, and privacy engineering school can set you on a path to any one of these careers. There are also many certifications one can get to enter this field of privacy. If you're interested, I'd urge you to read some books and do some research as it is a growing field. And hopefully these last couple of sections have introduced you to some new areas of technology that you can pursue and has opened up some new doors for you. Thank you so much for listening to our talk on staying internet safe. During these times when technology is ubiquitous, it's crucial that we all know how to stay safe while using it. We hope you take some of these points back with you and implement them in your day to day. If you have any questions regarding any of the topics we discussed today, please feel free to follow up by emailing ngywitquestions at netapp.com. And be sure to mention the workshop name, Stay Internet Safe, in the subject line. Thank you.